Ladies and gentlemen, Minecraft 1.17 has been out for a little while now and of course there is a main update video showing all the gameplay changes on this channel. You'll find a link in the video description and in an iCard on the screen if you want to take a look at that first. Because in this video we're going to focus on the technical use in this version, including commands, game rules, entities and data, loot tables, advancements, particles, tags, text components, resource pack changes, shaders and much much more. There are several minor bug fixes that I will not be bringing up in this video and one major thing that will not be in this video is all of the changes to custom world generation. All of the changes to experimental data packs for custom worlds will be in a separate video that is still coming because otherwise this video will become far too long. There are quite a lot of such changes. Anyway, my name is Slice Slime. Without further ado, let's dive in and start with commands. A command has been removed, that is slash replace item. Instead, there is a new command called slash item that modifies the item or block inventory much like replace item did, but with some new bells and whistles. You can do item replace just like replace item before. The syntax here is item replace then a target with an item stack and optionally a count. That is exactly the same as replace item used to be. It is just a new syntax. There's also item replace a target from and a source with optionally a modifier. This will copy an item from a source to a target and apply the modifier to it if the modifier was specified. We'll get back to the modifier concept. The final form of the item command is item modify followed by a target and a modifier which modifies the item in place without copying it. Now the possible sources and targets should be familiar from other commands and from replace item before. They are either entity followed by a selector and a slot or block followed by a position and a slot. These item modifiers then, well item modifiers are separate files in a new item underscore modifiers directory in a data pack. Each file contains either a single function in the form of a JSON object or an array of functions in the form of a JSON array and the contents use a loot table function syntax to describe modifications of items. More command news in this version. The debug command has changed, the debug report form has gone, and a new sub command has been added, it is slash debug function. Debug function has exactly the same syntax as the function command. It executes the function specified, but every executed command and output message, even if that output message would normally be invisible, gets logged to a file. This has to be run from the input line, either the console or the chat. It cannot be run from inside a function. The output file will show a hierarchy of the things that happened and will have one line for everything that happened. It will be prefix C for a command that ran, R for a return value with the result value specified, F for a nested function call, E for an error that occurred, or M for an output message, even in the cases where this output message would normally not be shown. A final command change is that the give command has been restricted a bit. The maximum is now 100 stacks of items at a time. The number of items is not restricted, it is the number of resulting stacks that is restricted. So for instance you could give somebody 6400 sticks or 100 gold shovels. Let's move on to game rules. There are two new game rules in this version. One is called freeze damage. It is by default true and works much like fire damage or any of the other damage game rules and that it controls whether players take freeze damage or not. The other new game rule is called players sleeping percentage. The default value here is 100 and it sets the percentage of the players in the overworld that need to sleep to skip the night. Setting it to zero will mean one player is always enough to skip the night. Setting it to above 100 will prevent skipping the night entirely. Any value between 1 and 100 will cause a value to show up in the action bar when you sleep showing you the status and how many more players need to get to bed. Let's move on to entities and data. There is a new entity in this version called Marker. Markers are a special new type of entity meant for custom use cases like map making and data pack. That is for you folks watching this video. Marker entities only exist on the server side. They are never sent to clients. They don't have any updates on their own. In technical terms, their tick method is completely empty. 
For most use cases where area effect clouds are currently used or even marker armor stands, marker entities will be better and more performant. There are some exceptions, of course, since they are never sent to clients, they can't be used to display any type of text or graphical elements. They also cannot be vehicles. If anything tries to ride a marker, it will be immediately dismounted. And in terms of data, they have one special field. It is called data and its compound field, it will simply contain any custom data that you put there. Another new entity is the goat. It is one interesting field. It is called is screaming goat, which is a Boolean field controlling whether the goat is a screaming goat or not. There are also some interesting memory values in its brain data to explore, but I'll leave those for you to check out. Another new entity is the Glow Squid. Interesting field here is Dark Ticks Remaining, which controls how long the Glow Squid remains dark after pulsating. Speaking of glowing things, the Glow item frame is added in this version as works exactly like other item frames, including the fact that it can be hidden, locked, and so on. And the final glowing thing is that Glow Signs have been added. They are just the same as other sign, but have a special value indicating that they are glowing. Our final new entity in this version is the Axolotl. Potentially one of the interesting things here is the variant, which is a number controlling which of the different types of Axolotl you get. Its brain data also has several interesting values, but I'll leave you to explore those by yourselves. There's a new data tag that can be used for any entity. It is called Has Visual Fire. If you set this to true, then the entity will display a fire animation as if it was on fire, even if they are not actually on fire. Projectile entities now have a has been shot field. When this is false, it will cause the projectile to emit a game event the next tick. We'll get back to game events later in the video. The explosion power field of fireballs and gas is now a byte rather than an integer. And the maximum size that slimes can be summoned with is now 128. And another limit is that area effect clouds now enforce a maximum radius of 32. Of course, there are tons of added block types in this version, but I'll bring up one in specific, the light block. Light blocks have two block state properties. They are waterlogged or not, and then the light level between 0 and 15. The item is the same in your inventory regardless of which level it has, so you'll need to use a block state tag to get the different items. Some block and item IDs have changed. They are Grass Path, which is now called a Dirt Path, and Cauldrons, which are now split into several different blocks instead of just a state. They are Cauldron for the Empty Cauldron, Water Cauldron for the Cauldron with Water. In addition to this, there are new types including Lava Cauldron and Powder Snow Cauldron. Let's talk about some changes to text components. Components that print lists of names like selector or NBT can now override the separator. By default, this is comma followed by space. This uses the separator element and the separator in turn can contain any text component. Let's talk about particles. There are a whole slew of new particle types in this version. They are small flame, snowflake, Dripping Dripstone Lava Dripping Dripstone Water Falling Dripstone Lava Falling Dripstone Water Glow Glow Squid Ink Falling Spore Blossom Spore Blossom Air Electric Spark Scrape Wax on, wax off. There are also some special types, including light, which works just like the barrier particles from before, and two special particles with extra parameter. They are vibration and dust color transition. Vibration takes the extra parameters start, end, and travel time, where start and end are XYZ coordinates specified with doubles, and travel time is an integer value specifying the time for the vibration to travel between the two positions in ticks. Because these extra parameters specify exactly how the thing moves, a bunch of the normal parameters that you still need to specify afterwards on the command line don't really matter. That includes the position, which doesn't matter, and the speed, which also doesn't matter. In fact, the only parameters from the rest of the line that still have any form of impact is the force or normal and target player's parameter. 
Dust color transition is like a redstone dust particle, but that shifts from one color to the other. It also takes extra parameters, which is a starting RGB value followed by a size and then an ending RGB value. The rest of the command is then specified as per usual. Let's talk about some changes for resource packs. The performance has been improved when you use many overrides on an item model. That can be an interesting change for this version. The drowned arm texture has been reversed by the model, that is, the mapping is now correct. But that also means that if you have a custom texture, then one of the arms will now be inverted when on the model. And the mirror ring has changed on a number of blocks. That includes changes to the texture mappings of stone cutters, ladders, vines, crops, chains, chain parts of lanterns, sea pickles, string, and the string parts of the tripwire hooks. Some unused textures have been removed, including the ruby texture and the footstep texture, so if you've used those in any matter, then you'll have to include them in a resource pack yourself. The user interface files also have some changes. Icons.png now has entries for the frozen hearts for when freezing, and there's a new file for the freezing overlay. Toasts.png now has a new entry for the bundle tutorial, and the bundle UI has its own new separate file. Slots for the game mode selector are now 26 pixels instead of 25, so you'll need to adjust that if you have that overridden. And finally, the credits are now specified in a JSON file instead of in a text file. Let's talk about shaders. This version of Minecraft updates to using OpenGL 3.2. This means that the ancient technology of fixed function pipelines is finally gone from the game, and the game now renders fully using shaders. All of the shaders except the Blitz shader can be replaced in resource packs, but this is experimental and not supported, so take care. The format will change in the future, so keep that in mind. The new shaders folders are under the Minecraft namespace called shaders slash core and shaders slash include. The shaders files contain a meta command as well, it is hash moj underscore include which is used to include other files. Now, this video will not be going through all of the different shaders and all of the different inputs for them, but I'll leave you some links to good resources in the video description. There are some example resource packs by Felix, or Silifian, who is another developer on the team. Uh, there's also a list of block types using different render types that Bok, another developer, published. And the community has been working on a shared document which lists which shader does what in the game. I'll link all of those in the video description. The Minecraft Commands Discord is also a good place to look for community development on this stuff. I'll leave a link to that in the video description as well. One final note when it comes to rendering and shaders is that glowing translucent entities now properly merge their outlines with other glowing entities. What you see is simply the resulting outline of the glow. Let's talk about loot tables. There are some added loot table functions in this version. Let's start with the set banner patterns that has parameters patterns, which contains a list of pattern objects, each with its pattern and color. The pattern is the name of the pattern, such as square, bottom, left, bricks, or so on. And the color is the name of a color, such as red. The function also has an append parameter. If true, that means that the new elements will be appended to the existing ones instead of replacing the entire banner pattern. Another new function is set enchantments. It modifies the enchantments on an item and has the parameters enchantments, which is a map of enchantment ID to level value. And that value can be a score or a random number. We'll take a look at value providers for this in a moment. It also has an add parameter, which, if you set it to true, makes the change be relative to the current level. If you set it to false, then the level will be replaced with the current value, and if you want to remove an enchantment, set its level to zero. There are changes to some existing functions as well. The set damage and set count functions now have an add parameter, which, if true, will mean that the change will be relative to the current value. If the parameter is false, then the value will be replaced, just like the current behavior. And the copy nbt function source parameter can now be set to storage with a namespace id to access command storage. So what about those value providers? Well, loot table values are now generalized to value providers. Value providers can be used in the same place as random number generators could before. This means that, for instance, you can put a random value number generator inside the maximum of another random value. In addition to this, there is a new value provider. It is called score and returns a scaled scoreboard value. The 
parameters to this are score for the scoreboard name, target, which is the same as the target in the score predicate, and scale, which is the scaling factor. To access a hardcoded name instead of an entity parameter, use a score holder name colon and then the name of the score holder. Using this, you can use scoreboard values directly as they are or use them as the minimum or maximum value for a random value generator. And finally, for loot tables, let's talk about conditions. There's a new condition called value underscore check, which checks the range of a value. The parameters to this are value, which is one of those new value providers, and range, which is a min and max range. Let's talk about advancements. There are new triggers in this version. Let's start with started riding. This triggers when a player starts riding a vehicle, or an entity starts riding a vehicle already ridden by player. The conditions for this one are player, which is either the player that started riding or that was already riding. There's also a lightning strike trigger. It is triggered when the lightning finishes, which is when the lightning bolt entity disappears. Triggers for any player within a radius of 256 blocks of this event. The conditions are player, which is the player for which this trigger runs, lightning for the lightning bolt entity, and bystander for one of the entities in a certain area around the strike who was not hurt by it. And our final new trigger is using item. It is triggered for every tick using an item, and using an item here is defined as something that you hold down your use button to do, including charging a crossbow, looking through the spyglass, or eating food. Conditions for this are player, which is the player that uses the item, and item for the item being used. There's also a change to an advancement trigger, it is effects changed, that now has a source which matches the entity that triggered the change. That could be empty if there is no entity, for example if you got the effect from a beacon, the effect was self-applied or that was an effect that got removed. Change predicates for this version, the item field of the item predicate has been changed to items and now accepts an array of item types rather than just one item. Same goes for the block field in the block predicate, which has been expanded to blocks and now accepts an array of block types. This is not optional, you have to change these for your advancements to work. The entity predicate now has a new sub predicate for passenger, which is for passengers directly riding the vehicle. If you have that present, it must match one or more of the passengers. There's a new stepping on location predicate for the block that the entity is currently standing on, and a lightning bolt sub predicate which is only valid if the entity is a lightning bolt. That lightning bolt predicate in turn has blocks set on fire, which is a range check for blocks set on fire by this entity, and entity struck which is a predicate for entity struck by this lightning. If that is present it must match one or more entities. Player predicate now has a looking at sub predicate, that is the entity currently being viewed by the player. It uses the same line of sight of rules as mobs trying to attack, and the actual detection radius might be changed in the future. Let's move on to structures and let's start with some fixes for structure blocks. The default mode of structure blocks is now load and the data mode is hidden. You can access that by clicking the mode button while holding the alt key. Barrier blocks and light blocks now also show if you have the show invisible blocks setting turned to on, and a few bugs have been fixed including that structure block data length was limited to 12 rather than 128, and when a structure load water sources in that structure would spread into water loggable nearby blocks regardless of how they were set up, that is fixed in this version. Let's talk about scoreboards and statistics. The statistic for playtime has been renamed to play underscore time. It used to be called play one minute, but it was actually increased one by every tick. There's a new statistic as well called time with the world open or total underscore world underscore time. That also includes the time when the game is paused in single player. And then a whole number of bugs have been fixed with statistics not increasing when the corresponding action was done. That applied to applying a die to a sign taking any substance out of a cauldron with a bucket or placing that fluid back inside of the cauldron, using a glass bottle to take or place water into a cauldron, using a glass bottle or shears to harvest material from a beehive or nest, or using shears to carve a pumpkin. Same went for equipping electro or armor by using it from the hot bar, igniting TNT like for instance using a flint and steel or a fire charge, using fireworks rockets to fly, or composting compostable items. 
Let's move on to tags, and let's start with block tags. There are a whole bunch of added new ones. A whole category of them are added under the mineable subfolder. They are mineable axe, mineable hoe, mineable pickaxe, and mineable shovel. Blocks within these tags can be destroyed more quickly with that matching tool. In conjunction to this, there are also needs stone tool, needs iron tool, and needs diamond tool block tags. If a block requires the correct tool to drop, then these tags determine which tier of that tool is required. There are also a number of other tags, including dirt, which controls a whole number of things, from which things can be turned into dirt paths to which things can support planting of flowers above them. There's also small drip leaf plantable, which controls which blocks small drip leaves can be planted on. Some sound related tags are crystal sound blocks, which are the ones that make the crystal noise when walked on, and inside step sound blocks, which are blocks that make the step sound when you are inside of them, not just when you walk on top of them. This includes, for instance, snow layers and powder snow. Some new block tags also affect world generation. They are deep slate or replaceables, dripstone replaceable blocks, features cannot replace, geode invalid blocks, lush ground replaceable, moss replaceable, and lava pool stone replaceable. Note that that last one has the wrong name. The actual functionality is the inverse. Any block placed in this tag cannot be replaced by stone. Also note that moss replaceable controls the blocks that can be replaced by moss also using bone meal. There are ore collection tags for all the ores in this version since there are multiple types of ores. They are coal ores, copper ores, diamond ores, emerald ores, iron ores, lapis ores, and redstone ores. Some other new collection tags also appeared in this version. They are candles, candle cakes, cave vines, cauldrons, and snow. Finally, there's an occludes vibration signals block tag that controls which blocks occlude vibration signals from traveling to a skulk sensor. Item tags in this version, axolotl tempt items, control which items can be used to tempt and breed axolotls, cluster max harvestables controls which items can be used to get the maximum effect when harvesting an amethyst cluster, fox food contains all the items that foxes will eat, Freeze immune wearables controls the armor that will let you not take freezing damage. A couple of piglin related item tags. Ignored by piglin babies includes a number of items that will never be picked up by piglin babies. This includes for instance leather that tended to be picked up by piglin babies, thus making them persistent and causing them to gather up in the world. The same goes for the other new tag which is piglin food. Items in this tag will still be able to be picked up by piglin babies and piglins, but it will also cause them to consume the item rather than store it. There are also collection tags for all the ores and candles, which are the same as the block tags, and occludes vibration signals for item tags as well. There are new entity type tags as well. Axolotls always hostiles lists entity types that axolotls will always consider hostile and attack and axolotl hunt targets, which contains entity types that axolotls will hunt, but only occasionally. There's also freeze hurts extra types for the type of entities that take extra freezing damage, freeze immune entity types for the entities that take no freezing damage, and powder snow walkable mobs for the mobs that are able to walk on top of powder snow. And there's a new type of tags in this version. They are game event tags, but to go through those, let's start by talking about game event. A new game event system has been implemented to support the skulk sensors detecting vibrations. This system has been developed to identify when certain in-world actions are happening in nearby chunks, and the system is currently only used for the skulk sensors, however it might be used for more things in the future. Here is a list of the initial game events. Now there are tags for these game events too, and they can be modified by data packs. You can find them under the tags slash game underscore events folder. There are two ones by default. They are vibrations, which lists all of the game events that are considered to be vibrations by the skulk sensor. The default value for this is all of the different event types. There's also an ignore vibrations sneaking game event tag, which contains the game events that should be ignored by the skulk sensor if the source of the event is sneaking. Let's move on to performance. There's a new shortcut in this version, it is F3 and L. That shortcut will generate and persist performance metrics from in-game and store that in a zip file. The file ends up in debug slash profiling slash a timestamp and then dot zip. The profile will run for 10 seconds or until you hit F3 and L again to stop it early. 
The exact metrics might change for future versions, but Misode has made a very nifty visualizer for these files that I will include a link to in the video description. There's a corresponding thing on the server side, it is a new command that is called slash perf. You use this with slash perf start and slash perf stop, and it will generate a zip file in a similar manner. This functionality is what replaces the slash debug report command. A couple of performance related bug fixes worth mentioning as well. Jigsaw structures would cause data fixer spam output in the log that is fixed in this version. And when loading the skin of a custom player head, then you would get a lag spike the first time that happened in a session that is fixed in this version. Let's talk about a few things related to modding. Minecraft has upgraded to Java 16. This means that modding frameworks and all kinds of surrounding tools are also upgrading. Keep an eye on that. I know at least Firebrick has upgraded the example repository and there's a post about how to upgrade. I'll try to link that in the video description as well. For custom launchers, there is new data in the launcher manifest files that shows which Java version is used for a certain version of the game. Fields here are component, which lists a component identifier for the Java installation, as well as the major version for that Java runtime. Another big change for modders is that unused parts of the codebase are no longer stripped. That is to say, dead code stripping is now off in the shipping of Minecraft. This doesn't necessarily impact you that directly, but it does mean that constant names are now available and I know at least Fabric now has functionality to place those back into the deobfuscated code. It also means that some tooling surrounding the game is now available. A change has been made in how things are stored as well. This includes the file storage for entities. Entities are no longer stored together with the blocks and block entities. Instead, they are stored in a separate entities directory, similar to the point of interest storage. Inside of this, entities are still stored in per region files, however. One notable impact of this is that chunk loading is no longer guaranteed to be immediate. That is to say that when a chunk loads, including as a result of the force load command, the game will no longer stall and pause until that load has finished. Instead, the game will keep on ticking and the chunk will appear later. Most notably, this means that you can no longer guarantee that you can select an entity inside a freshly loaded chunk. Finally, let's talk about some changes for servers. Servers can now require custom resource packs to be accepted by setting the require resource pack property in server.properties. When you have this option on, then players will be prompted for a response and the option will be to disconnect if they decline to use the resource pack. You can also configure an additional message to be shown together with this prompt by setting the resource pack prompt property in server.properties. This expects chat component syntax and can contain multiple lines. If you also have users who have previously permanently declined a server resource pack, they will now get the question anyway if the pack is mandatory. Another properties related change is that the max build height server setting has been removed from the properties file. And finally, a bug fix worth mentioning, servers were unable to prevent a player from dismounting a vehicle that has been fixed in this version. And that was all I had for you for today. Like I mentioned, custom world changes will be coming in a separate video, so keep an eye out for that one if you're interested. But for now, thank you for watching to the end of this video, I do appreciate it. If you found this video helpful, then please help me out in return. Any interaction with the video, like leaving a like or dropping a comment or sharing the video, will help it out on the grand YouTube algorithm race. So I do appreciate that. Also, I want to give a thank you for the people who have helped me through the upgrade videos on the snapshots for this version and the main upgrade video. You'll find them listed in the video description. Thank you. And that's it for me for today. My name is Sliced Lime. And I'll see you next time.